later if those who wants to watch it later it will be posted in uh, in uh, you know some official so perfect let me move on to the sharing Is this visible to everybody? Maybe someone can unmute and say, because as a presenter, it's very difficult for me to interpret. Yes, yes. Perfect. Thank you, sister. Um, maximize it. OK. Uh, please bear with me because I have notes to look at. So if this is okay for you people, this view is okay for everybody? Okay. Perfect. Inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, dear brothers and sisters, this, as I mentioned clearly that this was presented in one of the symposium recently uh, organized by the uni one, IPB University from Indonesia. So what I felt, it, this is really helpful. And uh, in general case, what happens when the students concentrate on DNA or any molecular studies, they per initially do not know which marker to be selected, number one. Number two, they may know a lot of issues regarding the methods and so on, or they will learn time to time, but they will select the wrong markers. Ultimately, what happens when it comes to when it comes to uh, the data interpretation, everything is wrong. For example, those who wants to work on population genetics, for example, if they select the marker in the mitochondrial DNA, something like a cytochrome oxidase, the gene that is responsible for coding the respiratory protein, okay, then it is entirely wrong. And most of the cases, of course, the supervisors will help and so on. But in general case, they, the student or the researchers might not know what exactly they are selecting as the molecular marker to address the information that they're supposed to address it. I mean, to answer the question that they wanted to address on. So uh, in this presentation, uh, you will come across technical words, by the way. All these words are interconnected and out at the end of this 30 minutes of presentation followed by the Q&A session, you will come to know uh, a lot of keywords and what exactly these keywords are all about. Because uh, when it comes to gene, allele, uh, RFLP, AFLP, and so on, confused in, in general case. But I made it uh, much simpler for the people to understand. So let us move on to the presentation directly. And if you have questions later, uh, you can text me or you can open uh, it anytime. Uh, your, uh, yeah, you can unmute and ask the question at any time. You can stop me because it's an interactive session. So no need to worry about waiting until the end of the sessions and so on. Okay, let me bring it to the second slide. Okay, when it comes to uh, any molecular markers, okay, application, this presentation was initially prepared to address um, molecular markers in aquaculture practices, okay? But uh, you will come across a lot of keywords as well. Here, whatever the papers, the research paper that you come across, you will come across a lot of technical words like a gene. Of course, we know a gene is the uh, ATGC. Whatever is there in the DNA, DNA is made up of amino, amino acids, and which is again made up of uh, nucleo uh, nucleotide-based pairs, which is Adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine, okay? ATGC is the constituents of the gene. And when it comes to allele, you might have come across this word allele a lot of times, but people get mis confused. They do not know the exact difference between the gene and the allele. So if I have to explain it, very simple terminology. For example, if you go and buy the water bottle, the mineral water bottle from the store, you will have a lot of varieties. Okay, this company and that company and so on. If you um, try to understand the difference between the gene and the allele, the water is the gene, the variant is the allele. So different companies variety is the allele. For example, different forms of the gene, 
but that forms the same function that actually performs the same function that is a water to drink and twist our thirst you know so this is the exact difference between the gene and allele in general case over past like uh, before 1950 what happens people were using a different molecular markers even that time itself but they usually use the molecular marker called allozymes okay allozymes to identify what species it is um whether this species is like uh, or uh, whether this gene is highly potential enough or not because allozymes are the enzyme coding protein genes uh, so they target the allozymes as a main uh, stuff but they use the hybridization techniques for example perhaps you might have come across the word hybridization they transfer the dna or the isolated uh, protein into uh, nitrocellulose membrane paper and then they identify it so that way they used to identify it but it is mostly towards a morphological characters for example if they want to identify which plant to be uh, to be crossed to produce a disease resistant strain disease resistant or very fast growing plant so they try to take two plants they isolate the allozymes and then they do a hybridization they take multiple plants by the way then they will see oh okay this band is appearing in the exact position between the a and plant b so they will try to cross breed this to a and b plant to come out with the desired variants but it is only at the protein level so later after 1950 what happens we know that watson and crick uh, the the first one who ex actually explained about the dna helical double helical structure and the adenine and the nucleotide base pairs and so on after the 1950 what happens the people started thinking why don't we use a nucleotide level identification for identifying any animal or plant or gene expressions and so on but we haven't come across the gene expression yet we still in the dna level because only after 1970 the people were thinking okay why don't we go ahead with the gene that are actually responsible for coding the protein itself that is where we we come up rna and so on cdna and so on we will come across it and the other keywords that will you will come across is the nucleotide base pairs as i mentioned it is a t g c adenine guanine and thymine cytosine and also you will come across the words like uh, introns and exons introns are the the part of the dna where it doesn't code for any protein or something doesn't get expressed but exons are actually present in between two introns which actually codes for a dna however previously the people thought that oh we have both introns and exons do we need to have an introns in the dna but later they found that the introns are also responsible for the gene expression of any particular exon so that way introns and exons which is non coding and coding genes are responsible for gene expression in any of the animal or human for that matter then you will come across the words like rflp restriction fragment length polymorphism rapd aflp okay uh, we will come across we will go through it um, in detail in the next slides and you will also come across like a microsatellite mini satellite a uh, single nucleotide polymorphism uh, like a simple sequence repeat or variable tandem uh, sequence repeat and so on all these things are just a keywords that you just have to think of it okay for example you take if i have to explain everything in one single um, paragraph for example you take a dna you divide into double helical structure you divide into two okay you will have a single strand for example the microsatellite for example microsatellites are uh, you know how the dna will look alike if you happen to see uh, the at the nucleotide level some part of the dna there will be a same uh, sequences that will be keep on repeating for example a t a t a t and so on okay it will be keep on repeating in the whole stretch of the dna so this a small portion of the satellite that actually keep on repeating is called the microsatellite okay and there are mini satellites They usually make microsatellites are about 6 to 10 base pair length okay 
it will be ATG, AT, 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 and then followed by some sequences, followed by AT, 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 and then some sequences will be there, and followed by AT, AT, and so on. Okay, this AT, 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 three times appearing uh, uh, repeated sequence is called the microsatellite. Okay, whatever is between two microsatellites is a mini satellite, or or in, in, in some cases, what happens, the whole stretch of DNA, there will be like 800 to 1,000 base pairs, okay? It will be, uh, it will be like uh, same amount, uh, same sequences may be repeated, same nucleotide being repeated. So these are called variable number tandem repeats. So this is how they actually explain it. And when you compare between uh, animal one, and the animal too. And in some cases, there will be one single nucleotide is different from animal A to animal B. So that is called the single nucleotide polymorphism. Okay. But now the technology has advanced. Previously, we, were, we have been using the Sanger sequencing technique, which actually sequence very limited amount of um, portion of DNA at the one time. But now, because of the packed bio sequencing, you can have a whole genome sequence of the animal in very less cost as well. So using all these markers are technically known as marker-assisted selection, the last keyword that you can see here. Okay. If you categorize the molecular markers, the genetic markers into allozymes initially, which is the protein coding gene, the second one is the mitochondrial DNA, and uh, which is a maternally inherited. The third one is the nuclear DNA. Which DNA, which molecular marker that we're supposed to select for our subject matter? For example, if you're working in the medical field, okay, you wanted to identify which animal, uh, sorry, which um, patient is, which can cancer patient, for example, is having the high expression of a particular gene. So you just have to go ahead with the targeting that particular protein alone that particular gene alone. Okay, in some cases what happens, for example, you are trying to do uh, the gene expression of the allele or the gene, for example, in, um, uh, in um, blood, blood group uh, uh, that is responsible for the blood grouping, for example, A, A, B, O, right? So that particular allele will be, uh, that particular gene may be appearing in six different alleles. So you just have to target the primer that can target all the six alleles. Then your objective is achieved. If you work on only one or two genes, then the, uh, the results expression, gene expression level might not be so accurate. Whether you have to go ahead with the nuclear marker or molecular marker, uh, nuclear marker as well as or the mitochondrial marker, there are multiple methods that we will discuss it. Okay, when it comes to the nuclear DNA, it is, of course, the homologous recombination. It is not a circular DNA. Both male and female uh, chromosome merge to form the double helix. But in case of mitochondrial DNA, it is a maternally inherited, which is from the mother side. So, uh, for example, if you want to identify the, the fast, ex fast uh, developing genes, okay, which are unique to the father, for example. If you select, if you isolate the um, uh, mitochondrial DNA, it is waste of energy. You're wasting your time. And it is only the maternally inherited. And the mitochondrial DNA itself, it codes for about 23 proteins. Okay, mostly the respiratory protein. There is also a small fragment in the mitochondrial DNA, which is called the AT-rich region, um, that can be used for the population studies in general case. Okay, so it is the simple differences between the molecular, sorry, nuclear as well as the mitochondrial marker is the circular in nature, the mitochondria one, and the other one is the homologous recombination where both male and female one uh, merge together to form the uh, mixed DNA. Okay, when it comes to the techniques itself, the old one is the hybridization technique. Usually for the DNA fingerprinting or to identify the culprits and so on, or to identify the plant which is uh, coding for, uh, the plant which is resistant towards the disease or fast growing and so on. Uh, they used to use it previously, it's LP, 
which is restriction fragment length polymorphism. What they do, they isolate the DNA, cut into pieces using the restriction enzymes, and then they um, run the gel for multiple samples. Huh? Uh, then they transfer the gel into the cellulose paper, and once they use a specific probes or the 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 uh, as radioactive labeled probes to observe it under the X-ray, then automatically we will know which of the two animal or which of the two individual plant or whatever are expressing their genetic makeup at the same pace, at the same level. So in that way, they used to identify it, but it is so random and amount of DNA being isolated, we need to rely upon it, right? Because always we always get low quantity of the DNA in general case. So in this kind of, in this kind of uh, hybridization technique we have where RFLP or RAPD, whatever it is, usually in the RFLP, the amount of DNA is one of the crucial thing. Then the people came out with a new technique, which is random amplified polymorphic. It's very simple. Instead of cutting down all the, um, all the DNA, what they do, they use the randomly selected primers multiple primers together, then they target um, the nuclear genomic DNA, and then they amplify it. The amplified product, of course, when it comes to the word amplification, of course, we need to use the PCR, followed by the agarose gel, same like transfer into the nitrocellulose membrane paper, radioactive probe, then X-ray wave. In this way, we are ran number one, the advantage of the RAPD over RFLP is we are at least using some primers. In that, uh, in the previous one, of course not, right? Uh, so RAPD is far more better than RFLP. But here we use the random primers, so the reliability goes down. We do not know what gene are we going to target, you know? So in that way, it's not also okay. But when it comes to AFLP, amplified, fragment length polymorphism, the other technical words, where we isolate the DNA, we digest the DNA into uh, using the restriction enzymes, followed by uh, the primers, uh, so of course, uh, adapters were added uh, to the, both the sides of the cut DNA, and followed by the amplification using the specific primers. So automatically what we will know in the previous method, RF, RAPD, we use the random primers. But in the AFLP, we use the specific primers and also we use the adapters that can attach to the DNA strand, which is cut into pieces. So automatically, we can get the exact, uh, 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 exact pic picture of how the gene expresses in different animals or, or, uh, and so on. Uh, using the gel electrophoresis technique. The same method, but compared to the RFLP and RAPD, AFLP is far more preferred. And then comes to the microsatellite markers, because uh, those who work on the population genetics, identification of species and so on, uh, my humble suggestion is if you want to identify any species, you just use the mitochondrial DNA protein, which is the conserved region, the the region that can code for the protein, for example, cytochrome oxidase or 16S and so on. But when you want to study on the population genetics, for example, you're collecting the samples from one animal, animal from one particular area, and the sample from another area, or you are comparing that where the haplotype diversity and the nucleotide diversity, which animal is more stronger and so on, you just have to go with nucleotide, uh, sorry, uh, 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 the microsatellite markers or AT rich regions of the mitochondrial DNA. So you need to have a primers that can target the AT rich region rather than the cytochrome oxidase or uh, 16S or so and so on. So that way you just have to select the proper primer. In this case of microsatellite marker, it is used in the population genetic studies for in a greater way. Of course, the technique in, involves the isolations and uh, uh, they use multiple primers, like 15 to 20 primers, and also the species-specific primers. So in that way, they get the proper band uh, between the same species and between the population as well. 
So in that way, they also identify the population genomics and the population structure of the animal using the microsatellite marker. The same method goes to the mini satellite as well, uh, which is variable number tandem repeats and so on. But in this case of my microsatellite markers, it's one of the established method. We can target the wide genome distribution. Of course, it's distributed all over the genome. So easy to target and healthy, po uh, highly polymorphic region. So when it is a poly polymorphic region, then we can use it for the population studies. But if it is a conserved region, we can use it for the identification of the species itself. And it is a local spe locus specific and uh, compared to the AFLP, it is most cheaper. And if, of course, it's a PCR based. So when it comes to the money itself, how much we spend, microsatellite is far more cheaper than the previous one. But how many samples to select? But in general case, usually when we sample eight samples per location, it is the most appropriate one. But in case of medical studies, of course, you will go with the RNA that is coming up in the next. Okay, these are the other applications of the microsatellite marker. We can use it for the biological diversity study, estimating gene flow and so on, intraspecific, interspecific gene variations, mapping the gene loci, but and also diagnosing diseases. But these are, of course, the molecular markers like microsatellites, a very old one again. Again comes the EST. Perhaps you have come across two different terminologies in the paper. One is the express sequence tags. Another one is the open reading frame. Okay, in this way, if you understand what is the express sequence tag, then you already know what is the gene mapping actually. What we need to do, for express sequence tag, which one actually get expressed? If you happen to know what, it's only the cDNA, right? Only the RNA, which is transferred into mRNA, and then the cDNA being synthesized in the molecular studies, perhaps you have uh, learned it. But in that way, only the cDNA library being prepared for every single individual, um, uh, individual of the animal or the patient, for example. So if you target the express sequence tags using a specific primers to target identifying the complementary DNA, okay, complementary DNA that is synthesized from the DNA itself. Once we target that particular express sequence tag, we can have multiple uh, EST for one particular individual. In that, in this case, uh, maybe the uh, the patient or uh, animal or any anything for that matter, you know? So what happens after this? Uh, after they synthesize the uh, cDNA, they use a specific primers, a multiple specific primers. They attach the primers to only the five prime end and the, the, the corners of the EST. EST is about 800 to 1000 base pair length usually. So they use these primers to the completely identify what exactly the protein coding gene okay in some experimental treatment you will expect you will expect that when you induce this one the the gene is different you know gene expresses in different way in that cases you have to go with express sequence tags and then they uh, you know in the est we use primers that can attach to only the corners okay but in general case, when it comes to the protein coding gene, most of the information is in the middle, right? So that's why they do a ORF, open reading frame analysis, where, which one, the, the one that you can do it in NCBI, of course, where they synthesize the primers that can target the middle of the CDN. So in that way, they can have a millions of copies of ESTs for an, a small individual, for an animal or whatever, then, uh, once they blast the EST data and uh, with the available data in the NCBI or the public data banks, then they will know what exactly the gene mapping. So if they wanted to do, previously this EST was used for the whole genome sequencing project, but now after the availability of EST for almost all the animals in general, uh, you know, so we can use the EST as a very good tool to target uh, identify identification or the uh, or or uh, even for uh, 
many purposes like um, uh, obtaining data on the gene expression profile or the characterization of the expressed gene and the clone specific genes and so on, even if it is used in the phylogenetic tree analysis or some genes may be expressed only in some particular tissues. Okay, for example, if, if you have any objectives based on the ex gene expression studies, you have to go with the EST um, molecular markers, which can show which gene expresses in which uh, tissue uh, and the expression level can be identified using the RT-PCR. Okay, these are the other uh, exam, uh, are the benefits of the EST, which is, uh, as I explained, it is only from the mRNA, and it is used for synthesizing the cDNA libraries. Okay, and the mitochondrial mar markers, as I mentioned, that it codes for about 13 coding genes, and it has a D loop on top of it, as you can see. You, for any animal identification or plant identification, usually for the plant identification, you will go with ITS gene, okay, fungus identification. But for animal identification, you can use any of this red color or the yellow color, okay? Uh, this is a perfect one. And for the population study, you can see the D loop on, uh, on the top of the circular circle. Uh, we, can, we can target the D sequencing for um, uh, population genetic studies. And the major characteristics of different molecular markers are expressed here. For example, whether it is a co-dominant, for example, uh, it is the merging of male and female chromosome, or it's only from single uh, parent. So that way we can have a look, uh, we can identify which marker to be selected. For example, if you want to target the allozymes, which is very old, of course, you will not go with that. It is the co-dominant one expressed from more, both male and female. When it comes to microsatellite, it is from male and female as well. But when it comes to mitochondrial DNA, it is only from the single parent. So this way we can identify which protein to be, sorry, which expression of, uh, which molecular marker can be used for our uh, uh, objectives. And this marker evaluation and comparative efficiency, uh, when it comes to efficiency, of course, it is related to the money and so on. So this table will help you identifying what exactly the merits and demerits of different molecular markers. If you go with the AFLP, for example, cost effective, sorry, uh, it, it incur a lot of cost. But when it goes, go with the microsatellite markers, it's much more simple and easier to use it. And these are called uh, molecular uh, marker-based, uh, marker-assisted uh, sequencing and so on. And for example, if you are working on the zebra fish for the growth and so on, you will go with MY, MYOZ and the rainbow trout is this one and the grouper, tilapia, different genes have been identified expressing differently in uh, different treatment. So we can target this particular gene instead of going and to find out which molecular marker to be used and so on. So for the RNA, go with the EST, RNA studies, gene expression studies. For the DNA level, if you are identifying the species, go with mitochondria. If you want to do a population studies, go with the nuclear DNA. So these are some of the different candidate genes that are ex, uh, that are identified to be the uh, the best gene candidate using the marker assisted selection. And these last laws and policies, uh, if we use a different molecular markers, is there any law that actually stops and the policies are there, except the Nagman protocol, there is no other policies. For example, if you want to send your samples from Malaysia to Singapore or within any other countries, uh, you we just have to follow the, the criteria given by Nagman protocol because it's a biological samples. If we want to send from one country to the other, of course, it is not allowed. But there are, of course, a different methods to send it as well. Uh, but in terms of laws and policies, there is no much thing to discuss, in, uh, especially on uh, doing the lab work. But to transfer the samples, it incur a lot of one. For example, here in Malaysia, all the bird species are protected. Okay, so if you want to send any bird samples to anywhere outside of Malaysia, 
it will really kill you. I know it. Uh, we need to get a permission from the wildlife department, and there will be a, uh, presentations and so on. It really takes a lot of time. But in general case, they do not allow. They will ask us to do the experiment only in their labs. So this way, many animals are protected, exclusive to that particular region. But when it comes to molecular marker utilization, no problem at all. But here we did not discuss about the CRISPR sequencing technology, uh, the CRISPR uh, method and so on. But this is a bit advanced one CRISPR. So we will have it maybe in the next uh, upcoming webinars and so on. Uh, I hope this one is helpful to you. You're, you're most welcome to ask any question for that matter. If there is any question. Uh, Dr. John, uh, Dr. John, uh, thank you very much for sharing with us uh, uh, the differences and uh, selection on type of procedures that we can carry out. Uh, my question is uh, uh, related strongly to uh, when is the best, uh, uh, I mean the selection, when will it be best to differentiate uh, between northern blot, southern blot, western blot and eastern blot? The best. Uh, when do we decide which one shall we take? To select the blotting technique? Yes. Okay. Uh, for the northern blotting, usually you use the DNA. For the western blotting, you will use the different proteins and so on. So it's based on what molecular market are you going to target on. Okay. For example, if you work on DNA level, you can go ahead with northern blotting. It's much easier. But when it comes to protein and so on, more complicated methods where blotting techniques varies and so, uh, varies from one to another. But uh, we should know what exactly your um, objective. Instead of which you can go with AFLP, which is most appropriate and much easier compared to the blotting. And if you go with the DNA level identification, it is much more easier rather than the blotting technique because blotting was used in 1980s, but still they are using it, uh, you know, but preferably it's a DNA level identification. Thank you very much, Dr. John. Uh, the, the reason I brought up this question is because um, let's say if uh, uh, FYPs or uh, early career master students, usually their supervisors are taught using those methods. And when they continue practicing it, the students get confused on the optimization. Sure. So, uh, so they are exposed to conventional techniques. And then suddenly when they are asked to do, um, let's say, a high throughput sequencing, that is where the confusion gets started. Uh, yeah, big problem, you know, Dr. Brian. One of the big problem is uh, when it comes to sequencing, usually we outsource it, number one. Okay, and when, uh, when the supervisor asks the student to do, okay, go for a high throughput sequencing, they will think that it is crazy, really. Maybe how are we going to, how, uh, maybe the key words is the issue they worry about the sequencing. They think that it is like, uh, it's a huge work to then do and so on. Now you can get the sequences in one single hour. One hour, the complete sequencing is ready. Okay, in three hours, you can have even the whole genome sequencing. That's how the technology has advanced. And data analysis, there are multiple softwares, of course, and also there is a training programs in YouTube. If you watch it, it, you just have to follow that one. Uh, but why they have to do DNA sequence analysis, for example? If you want to identify the species, why do you have to go with the high throughput sequencing? It's not necessary at all. Unless and until you go with in-depth knowledge of how the homeobox gene expresses and so on. Okay, so uh, maybe there should be a proper coordination between the supervisors as well as the student, you know. Uh, otherwise, it's very difficult to come out with a proper solution for this. Yeah, thank you, Dr. John. Uh, another thing uh, uh, and another issue is like, for example, 
uh, one uh, supervisor would suggest them to use amplicons, another one would ask them to use primers, another one would ask them to use oligos, depending on the kits they are dealing with. So uh, the confusion will start when, uh, you know, for even at the uh, earlier career scholars, they are asked to, uh, to look at transcriptome analysis rather than the conventional technique. So the literature that they refer to is the conventional, but here we are, we are talking about CRISPR and you know, all the high-end uh, terminologies. Oh. So it is very good uh, that you're giving us this talk so that uh, you know, um, the younger generation would know which alignment to put themselves in and refer to the correct journals so that they acquire the basic knowledge. Yeah, and a very good advice to maybe the student is that, for example, if you are asked to use this particular amplicon sequencing, okay, they use you you try to write down all the technical terminology, read it a little bit in online, you will understand. It's amplicon is what is just a short fragment of DNA which is which is which is actually run in PCR. Then you get an amplicon. That's it. That's how it is. So why do we have to worry? It's just uh, maybe some people use a different isolation kit and so on. Don't worry about it. All of them will give almost equal amount of output. Okay. Uh, when, once you are asked to do some sort of transcriptomic analysis, very simple transcriptomic is after the DNA. We have a DNA, RNA, protein, right? So DNA is a simple molecular studies. When it comes to RNA, it's again a transcriptomic, okay, how the gene expression expresses in different organs and so on. So that way you will target the RNA. RNA is not that stable compared to the DNA. So you will have a lot of input and so on. Uh, that way, um, I, I think the student have to simply understand what exactly the meaning of the technical terminology that the people use, that's it. Once it is done, then, merge it with objective, then you will get a very good output, really. Thank you, Dr. John. Welcome, Brian. Yeah. If there's any other question, you may post. Hi, Dr. John. This is me, Hamza. Hamza. How does Hamza? Yeah, good. Perfect. All right. Thank you very much for the, yeah. Thank you very much for these uh, very good uh, introductory uh, lectures. On yeah, it's purely the marker. Yes. Right. Uh, I, actually, uh, I, I would like to recommend you uh, if you have like a, there's a other series of uh, the same themes of uh, lectures. Uh, it is good also for you to classify the molecular markers based on. The, the purpose, for example, it is for the identity, it is for the recognitions, or it is for detections, or it is for uh, yeah disease markers, for example. So on, yes. All right. So, yeah, uh, because uh, all of those techniques, it has a pro and cons, uh, especially when it comes to when we want to use the markers for the, uh, for example, high throughputs, or it can be fast or cheaper. Okay, for widely used in the dynastic things like that. All right, so that, that is just my suggestions. Uh, if you can actually uh, make make like a a group of okay, which technical markers? Which yeah, uh, yeah. That's really true. Um, I agree with that, but I actually intended out of this presentation, you know. Uh, to, uh, to make sure that the student get uh, overall concept of all the, what the molecular markers are all about. Because when, it, when we use the keywords, they get fear. That is the only thing that comes to their mind. You know, when it comes to DNA, RNA, gene expression, and so on, they get fear first. What they need to know is fearless understanding of the keywords first. So that's why I, I use all the technical terminologies here. So they will understand it's just a simple DNA, single strand, uh, where it is just a repetition of the ATGC and so on. So at least they will understand it. And But the classification, I agree, totally agree with your point. All the molecular markers, whether you use a CRISPR or whatever it is, 
it has the merits and demerits that's why last month uh, last month no, two, 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 two weeks back there was a paper published in science they come out with the new uh, technology that will change the crispr technology in the near future i forgot the name i think i, I forgot really but uh, there is a technology that is coming up but it is still in the animal study model you know it's not yet in the bigger animal uh, studies yeah that, that's true that's true yeah actually uh, all of those techniques still uh, based on the site directed mutagenesis and on the uh, site specific uh, spicing Thank All right, thank you very much, Dr. John. Thank you, Hamza. If there is any other question, you may post, or you're most welcome to send an email or whatever it is, because it's better to learn about the techniques first before you start your experiments in general. So if there is any question, may post. Otherwise, we can proceed the other way. And this video will be uh, uploaded in uh, Innocent web page as well as um, in our YouTube channel. Later, uh, you can find in Innocent YouTube channel, you know, hopefully. There is no question in the group chat. So without further, I would like to thank all the students as well as the staffs for joining this web-based uh, web workshop. And I hope this is helpful to you. And if you wish the presentation slides, you're, you're most welcome to contact me personally. I will share with you all. Thank you very much, everyone. And Jazakallah khair. Bismillah ar سبحان الله بحمده سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك اشهد ان لا اله الا انت استغفرك واعتوب اليك